welcome back to Litigation Help. My name is Heather Hui Litwin, and today's video, we're going to uh, talk about separation agreements, and in particular, uh, whether couples have to go to a lawyer to get one done. So recently, there was this uh, interesting case called Anderson versus Anderson, in which the Supreme Court of Canada actually upheld an agreement that was made without any lawyer involvement. And in this case, uh, the wife had actually drafted the agreement, uh, which was executed in front of two witnesses. Um, and, but in addition, in addition, um, neither party uh, provided financial disclosure to each other, nor did they receive any legal advice. So um, later, what happened was when the wife filed for divorce, the husband asked the court to set this agreement aside. Now, the trial judge ruled in favor of the husband and found that the agreement was not binding. He ordered the wife to pay the husband a net equalization payment of about $90,000. But the, the Court of Appeal um, actually overturned this decision, and uh, the appeal court found that the agreement was binding, uh, and it ordered the husband to pay the wife about $5,000. So... Okay, excuse me. So joining me here today are our regular guests, uh, Laura Tarcia and Eva De Marino, both from Family Mediation Group. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Us. And we, and we like you. to talk over each other too. So always oh, a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask uh, Eva to start off first with this um, conversation today. So Eva, can you tell us what happened at the Supreme sure. Court of Canada? Just a highlights sure. of the decision. Sure. So the court issue that the Court of Appeal dealt with, well, the, the trial judge, the Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court all dealt with the same issue. Mm -hmm. And that is whether the original contract that the wife created yeah. was, was enforceable. So essentially, the question is, should the court intervene and void the contract, or should they acknowledge the contract and allow the parties to still follow it? And this is because the husband had regrets after he signed it a year and a half later, which yeah. is you know what Laura and I always say is the nightmare, right? A year yeah. and a half later, he had some regrets and he said he wanted it to be invalidated on the bat on the basis that he did not have legal advice. Yes. So as you said, you said it very well. The trial judge agreed with the husband and said the lack of legal advice concerned him enough that that it should be invalidated. And that he felt that there was no meeting of the minds in the contract, essentially mm -hmm. that the contract did not reflect what the husband and wife agreed to, and that because there was no critical legal advice, it should be overturned. Mm -hmm. The Court of Appeal took a different approach. First, they looked at the law, and they, they identified something that the trial judge missed. The trial judge missed that, it, so there's the law, and there's always loopholes in the law. And I'm going to explain this generally. Basically, the law in Saskatchewan says that, yes, there should be legal advice, but it is not necessary, okay? You can, the courts can still acknowledge a contract without legal advice. So that's the starting point. So technically, there is no law in Saskatchewan that says that there needs to be legal advice for a valid contract. Ontario has the same thing, which we're going to get to in a bit, Right. okay? So already that was an error that the judge made. The judge said, no legal advice, it should be overturned. The court said, no, it could be overturned, but it doesn't have to be. So then they looked at the other circumstances mm -hmm. regarding how these guys came to the agreement. And what I'm going to say, uh, and I'm going to say this over and over and over again, mm -hmm. is that the circumstances of this case are very, very important. Mm -hmm. So the Court of Appeal found, and the Supreme Court agreed, that there was no duress. No one was forced into this uh, agreement at all. Mm -hmm. The husband knew he could get legal advice and chose not to do it. So he made a choice mm -hmm. to say, I understand this. I don't need a lawyer. They, um, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court saw the intention. Now, whenever we are trying to figure out um, a, a contract or we're trying to interpret a contract, we want to look at intention. Mm -hmm. What was the goal of the parties? The intention here was that the parties wanted to keep the assets that they had a date of marriage and um, only split the increase of assets during the relationship. That that resulted in $5,000. That's how they got that in the original agreement. The wife would have to pay the husband 5,000. Mm -hmm. 
So they looked at the fact that they wanted a clean break. They just wanted to split the assets that accumulated during a very short marriage of three years. Right. They both knew they could get legal advice and chose not to. And right. they both did have an understanding of each other's financials. There was no, no formal um, financial disclosure that lawyers would have clients do, but they did understand each other's financials. They knew what each other had. And so what the Court of Appeal said and what the Supreme Court said is taking that all into account, then we should keep the contract in place because there's then it would be unfair. The wife has already moved on, right? She thought that she would just pay the husband $5,000 they each got their own property. And for him to come back a year and a half later is also would be unfair to her, right? And so that was the reasoning um, really from the Supreme Court. So really what the Supreme Court said was in this case, we want to respect the autonomy of the parties. Mm -hmm. there, there is no evidence, the Supreme Court said, that there was force, duress, the husband didn't understand the contract that it would be relatively unfair. Um, and so they made him stick to his word and, and kept yeah. that contract. That is a really great summary. Oh, um, <laughs>Um, can you guys just kind of refresh our memory as to these technical requirements for, for a separation agreement? Sure. So maybe I can speak to some of the legal requirements and Laura can speak to some sure. of the um, relationship dynamics and the duress and things like that that we see in mediation. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the legal requirements, this case actually did not change the law at all. Um, mm -hmm. Lawyers should not be surprised by this case. Uh -huh. um, so essentially... The law is still the same. Even in Ontario, as it was in Saskatchewan, a separation agreement, all that it has to be is written, written. signed by the parties, and witnessed by witnesses. Okay? Oh, okay. That is a valid contract. Right. Now, that is what the law says. Then the law says that a contract can be invalidated for certain reasons. Where there are children involved, if the contract is not in the best interest of the children. Right. So, you know, if let's say, for example, one person says, okay, you know what, I don't want you to be the parent of our child anymore. That could possibly be invalidated, right? right. Um, if the child support is insufficient. The third reason is if the proper financial disclosure was not done. So in this, in the case that we saw, there was some disclosure, the parties knew of each other's finances. Uh -huh. but there does have to be um, an acknowledgement and an awareness of each other's financials. Okay. And lastly, that both parties understand the contract. Right. So generally, as long as those things are in place legally, um, then you technically don't need a lawyer. Mm. Right. Now, a lawyer or someone with a legal background, as we do in mediation, can meet these issues so that it is not set aside. Right. So um, where the child support, um, making sure a person understands the contract, et cetera. And that's what mediation can do or what a lawyer can do to ensure that the contract isn't set aside in the future. Mm. Laura, um, I think you were going to address so the dynamics uh, relationship. Sure, the, the, relation, yeah, the relational happens. issues are also a factor that, that needs to be considered and taken into <laughs> account when somebody is entering a contract or when somebody is contemplating entering a contract or signing off on a contract. Yeah. Um, so once the legal issues ho hopefully are satisfied, then we we there is a there is an understanding that or an expectation that there is no duress or pressure from Ooh, either exactly. one of the parties to sign on the agreement. And pressure may look very, very overt or covert. So you can mm -hmm. say, you know, you can overt, it can be yeah. sign or else. Right. right? So yeah. it, it's, it, it's in your face, essentially, or covert. Yeah. You know, if you don't sign, then, uh, you know, uh, you're not going to see the child on Tuesdays, right? Yeah. right? So those those dynamics have to be considered and they weigh uh, they weigh a lot on on how, was was the was the um, getting uh, getting to the agreement. Was it done in a 
in an uncoercive way mm. no, nobody was pushed you know bullied into it and things like that so duress is very important mm. and that is one of the factors that was missing in here as well that was identified as a missing one so the judge did look at that and but he did not find any that you know there was no there was no duress uh when from either one of the parties when they signed the agreement so they fully understood uh, right, so capacity and duress is very important that you do understand and the uh, you're not pushed into it.